Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through your word today. As it's been shared, as we seek that it will fill our hearts and take root within us. I pray in the name of Christ Jesus, our Savior. I shared this story many several years ago with you, and uh, I thought it was a great opening for today. It's about a Baptist pastor who was fresh out of seminary, and he was assigned to a small church in rural Kentucky. And in his first sermon, he condemned gambling, especially gambling and betting on the horses. As you can imagine, in Kentucky, the sermon was not to be well received. You see, Reverend, the parishioners explained, this whole area is known for its fine horses, and a lot of our members make their living breeding racehorses. Well, the next Sunday, the pastor spoke on the evils of smoking. And again, his sermon was not well received, because, you know, Kentucky is tobacco country, right? And many of those members in that church grew tobacco. And the third week, the pastor preached on the evils of drinking, only to discover that there was a major distillery in the region that employed many of the people. Well, so chastised for his choice of sermons, the frustrated pastor explained, well then, what can I preach about? And a kindly older woman spoke up and said, Pastor, preach against those godless Chinese communists. Why, there isn't a Chinese communist within 4,000 miles of here. Now, before we delve into these uh, three teachings about anger and adultery and divorce and oaths, it's good to briefly review the last part of last week's scripture. You remember where it says, Jesus is telling his people, Think not that I have come to abolish the law, but rather I have come to fulfill all of the law. And then he tells them that your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Or, you know, what good is it? So the obvious starting point for those first teachings here that we hear are the commandments. Very familiar to most of us. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. And these next one, they're just teachings that come from Moses regarding divorce and oaths. Although they had come to have the, it's kind of like case law, isn't it, Dick? they would come to have the force of law in the courts. And uh, sometimes we lose sight of the reason for the commands. Some will say that the commands were given by God to keep us within a tight, straight, and narrow. Uh, so that God could watch us and always have something against us. And many in our day still just sometimes cling to that imagination of seeing God as like an old, stern-looking man looking down from heaven, watching our every move. Jesus wants us to understand, though, that God hasn't given these commandments for His pleasure, you know, so that He could get some kind of awful pleasure from watching us uh, miss them and mess them up. God has given us these commands and cares that we keep the law for our sake because He loves us and He wants the best for us. Anyone who's been a parent or who's watched kids at all will understand this illustration. I tell Nathan and Sarah to stop. You know, they're running down the ramp toward the parking lot. I say, stop! And what do they do? They keep going. And then I get down at their level and I have a conversation. And I say, when I tell you to stop, it's because awful pain, which thankfully didn't happen this time, could possibly happen in the future. And I want to protect you from that. And the way you protect it is by following what I say to you. And that's how it's been from the very beginning with God's creation. Though humanity got stuck on defining things down to the smallest minutia right from the very beginning. Satan came to Eve and said, did God really say? The scribes and the lawyers followed, sorry, Dick. They followed after them and wrote volumes on the law. And so that if a particular act was not prohibited in the writings, then it was permissible. And we know Jesus spoke against this often. He had a name for people who focused on the letter of the law but ignored the spirit. Jesus called them at one time whitewashed tombs because they looked wonderful on the outside, but inside they were completely rotten. They were filthy because they were all about looking beautiful on the outside instead of looking beautiful and being beautiful in their heart. So Jesus gives us the favor here of pulling back the curtain, drawing it back, so that 
we can see all that is at stake for our relationships in these commands. In kingdom living, he starts out, it's not enough just to refrain from murder. Kingdom life involves treating each other, especially within the family of faith, but those without as well, with respect. And that means not harboring anger or speaking insults against another. Now, who of us here haven't struggled with the emotion of anger toward a brother or sister in Christ? It's, it's very, very common. Who of us hasn't insulted another from time to time? When we're angry and we throw insults at another, we're dehumanizing them. We're forgetting that they are a beloved child of God. And hostility that results even in verbal abuse is damaging in, in Jesus' mind just as worthy as punishment as murder. He lays out an alternative for us. What is that? The alternative of seeking reconciliation. And this particular scripture verse is one of the uh, chief reconciliation scriptures in all of the New Testament. Jesus points out that so important to him is reconciliation that it even takes precedence over the worship of Almighty God. Now we need to realize that Jesus was probably exaggerating a little bit when he said, leave your gift there at the altar and then go and be reconciled and then come back. Because these Galileans at the altar in Jerusalem would have to go about three days journey back home, you know, and then come back. So he probably wasn't quite being, he's just probably being tongue-in-cheek there. But his humor makes the point for us, nonetheless, that we are to live day by day in such a way that when we come to worship, there is no anger between us and somebody else in, in worship here or in worship in another sanctuary. We need to live in peace with one another as much as it depends upon us all the time. And if there is a rift between us and another, then the time to heal that is before we come and offer ourselves in worship. Is there somebody that you are at odds with today? Jesus would then ask you to make that initi initiative to fix things up, to bring peace into that relationship. Next up is the command about adultery. Oh, here we go, we think. And we can probably guess, after his teaching on murder, that it's not enough to avoid committing adultery, and we'd be right. The spirit behind this is what damage happens relationally long before adulterers hit the bed. Even using the thought or the image of anyone to satisfy our physical desires by lusting after them. Pornography, we know, has so, so sadly become so pervasive in our culture. It breaks my heart. I saw just in Friday's paper, you may have seen it, about a 37-year-old man charged with downloading images of girls involved in sex acts and he was charged with trying to buy a 10-year-old to keep it his home for sex. Just awful. Just awful. Talk about crimes against humanity. That's got to be about up there at the highest. The point Jesus makes is that violence to another human being happens <laughs> long before the actual command is broken. It begins with the long gazes, the lustful imagination. That lustful first look is almost impossible to avoid. We know that, especially us men know that. My boss first told me several years ago when I was just out of high school in my first job, he said, Chuck, it's the second look. Don't go there. He was a great Christian man, full of wisdom. Well, what's the solution? Is Jesus serious here when he says to cut out your eye? Uh, well, I think we know that that's probably not his intent, especially following what we think might be tongue-in-cheek comments with regard to anger. I think what he's saying is that whatever is the source of the struggle, the temptation, cut it out. Do what you have to do. Even if it feels like it's as severe as taking out your eye or cutting away your, your hand. Do what you got to do. Yes, it is severe. Yet Jesus' words ring true. Better to struggle through life without than to go to hell having all the pleasure we done the damage that we've done here in this life. And I want to conclude this by saying that if you is, or somebody you know is struggling with pornography and you know about it, don't delay getting whatever help you need because it is not victimless, even though oftentimes you'll hear there's, there's no victims, but there are. Similar is this point next we move to about divorce. 
And in order to hear Jesus here, we need to remember that his world was a world of male privilege. Things had gotten so bad in his times that wives could be cast aside for simply burning the evening chicken. You know, or whatever else was on the, on the kitchen stove that evening. Burning bread. Jesus is telling his male listeners, and I think this is very important to point out, I don't believe he's talking to couples here. I think he's talking to male listeners, and he's telling them that their wives were just not simply property, as they so often saw them, but they weren't just property in the kingdom. Jesus welcomed women to also be his disciples. And Jesus is doing something a bit different here with these two teachings, adultery and the one on oaths. Whereas with adultery, he left standing the commitment and broadened it. Here he reversed Moses' teaching, which he says in another place was provided because of the hardness of their heart. And I would suggest the reason is because in their hardness of heart, they forgot that their marriage partner is a beloved child of God. And in this culture of easy divorce, wives were just simply spun off whenever the Spirit so well moved them. And it's into that sort of calloused mindset that Jesus is speaking the truth of relationships as God's kingdom would desire them to be. Now, we know that the church has since day one struggled to follow Jesus here. Because we're not Jesus, are we? We're struggling. We're people who struggle. We sin. And of course, our culture is far different from the culture that Jesus lived into. Yet there are and there will always be many broken individuals within our circle of relationships because of divorce. And I want to say, make no mistake, God's grace is broad enough to cover even divorce. The spirit of what Jesus is teaching here would point us past the endless debates about when is divorce allowable to the question of how we can be lights to the world through and in our marriage relationships. So little is said or taught, unfortunately, about these relationships in some churches, especially small churches, that I wouldn't blame many young people, teenagers, for thinking that, well, well, you know, the church never said anything to me about any relationships, about sex or dating, so God certainly must not have anything to say. And I think it's, we do need to do more in the church to prepare young people for relationships, and especially for the marriage relationship. And we have to start, I think, ever more earlier in our day with age appropriate materials. In preparing young people for marriage, today religious leaders should differentiate between preparation for the wedding and preparation for marriage. We spend so much time often getting folks ready for the wedding, but we forget and neglect that it, that's only a day. Marriage is a lifetime. And the church can do more and do better at strengthening the sanctity of marriage. Because if we don't do it, who's going to? God does care about our relationships and our marriage relationships very much. He cares so much about His relationship with you and me that He sent Jesus to make things right. That's why we talk about things like righteousness in the church. Righteousness means a right relationship. Here in particular, we're talking about a right relationship with God our Creator. And He wants us to be in a right relationship with each other in all of the different orders of relationships we have. And His heart breaks for us when we aren't, no matter what the reason might be. Do you notice that this teaching on divorce falls in between this more basic teaching about lust and then lies? N.T. Wright notices in his commentary, Matthew, for everyone, that if people knew how to control their bodily lusts on the one hand and were committed to truth-telling on the other, there would be few, if any, divorces. And that's, that's worth repeating that. If people knew how to control their bodily lusts on the one hand and were committed to truth-telling on the other, there would be few, if any, divorces. That's worth repeating. Jesus was telling us that divorce, unlike it being on the table so easily for those of his day, divorce shouldn't even be on the table for those in his kingdom. Because if we're about fidelity and faithfulness and commitment to one another, then it should rarely even come up in conversation. This section about oaths is the last portion of the reading. 
let me, our words be truth all the time. Not only when we're uh, in Dick Meyer's courtroom. Well, he doesn't really have a courtroom, but you know what I mean. The last few weeks, political ads have been airing, citing the lie of the year from 2013. You probably see and saw that ad. And of course, most of any of the statements that are selected as the lie of the year didn't start out their lives purporting to be a lie, did they? No, they were bandied around as the truth. And we have grown so accustomed, haven't we, to public relation firms and spin doctors translating maybe into yes or no into maybe that we just take it for granted. We just get used to the fact that you, who can you trust anymore? Nobody, right? Hardly. We lie in a thousand little ways every day when we use language to evade telling the whole truth. When did you last do it? I'm not going to ask you to stand up and tell us when you did it. It might be incriminating, you know? And I'm glad Christine isn't here to hear this story, but I remember one time when she asked me to take something to the post office. I forget what it was, whether it was a gift or a, a bill, but I forgot. Until after the mail had gone. After four o'clock. So, in making sure it at least got started on its merry way, I dropped it in the mailbox. And uh, later, she asked me if I got the mail to the post office. You know what I said? I said, it's in the mail. <laughs> well, it's true, it is in my mailbox. Yes. Jesus wants us to know it isn't enough to avoid lying under oath. We should speak and act truthfully in all of our dealings. You ever wonder about that person who says, I tell you, I'll swear on a stack of bottles that this is true. <coughs> well, you, do you ever get the question in the back of your mind, well, how many other statements should you mention I make you swear to, you know, to make sure you're telling the truth? There's a story that uh, tells about some churches who were having revivals. And after the revivals had concluded, three pastors were discussing the results with each other. And I'm uh, thinking they must have had these revivals together. The Methodist minister said, the revival worked out great for us. We gained four new members. The Baptist preacher said, we did better than that. We gained six new members. And the Presbyterian pastor said, well, we did even better than that. We got rid of our ten biggest troublemakers. <laughs> Maybe the, they were the ones who you couldn't trust to tell the truth. <laughs> but if our conversation sometimes contains truth and sometimes not, how can we be trusted to be always saying the truth, except if we're under oath? Sometimes in our world we tell a lie, and we know we do so that we don't hurt another's feelings. I remember a letter coming into Dear Abby many years ago uh, asking, you know, uh, is it, you know, is it possible to never lie? And Dear Abby said, well, you know, if somebody brings up to you their, their newborn baby, and this baby was ugly. We know they know ugly babies, but in case it was, and I said, oh, isn't this baby the cutest baby ever? You would not say, no, it's ugly. You never say anything like that. Absolutely not. So we do. And, uh, but there's other times when we need to rethink that and really with grace, seasoned with love, share the truth. I was talking to a colleague who shared with a couple the other day, I think it was him that told this couple, that he had real reservations about them getting married. He, you know, they had come to him seeking counsel about their upcoming marriage. And after getting to know them and their situation and uh, just hearing their story, he just had to share the honest truth that he had some real serious reservations about them going forward. It's often difficult when we have to do that, especially because egos, we know our egos are fragile, and we know everybody else's ego is also fragile. Yet sharing truthfully with love, and that's the key. We need to be assertive, but we need to be assertive with love, not passive-aggressive or aggressive <laughs> towards somebody else. But when we share truthfully with love at all times, we can be the light of the world. And today, I want to invite us to call to mind two things. First of all, I want us to take just a moment here to call to mind a relationship in our lives that is one of the most important relationships in your life. One that's healthy and whole and good and that sustains you regularly through conversation, through visits. It might be a sibling, it might be a special neighbor, a friend, whatever it is. 
Think about what makes that a great relationship, why it's so important to you. And let's just take a moment in silent meditation to give God thanks for that person, the relationship. Now, I want us to call to mind another relationship that is maybe as equally important, but that suffered some damage. No need to figure out who was to blame for that damage or hurt, but instead, let's also spend a few moments and hold that person in prayer and that relationship in prayer. Offer that broken relationship to God as an offering and as a place in your life that you want to open up for God to use uh, and bring help and healing. Think about what action you might be able to take to move that relationship toward greater health. And let's just join together here in a few moments of quiet prayer that God would continue to use the truth and the grace of the gospel to heal and restore our relationships. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you today. We know that we are broken people. We know that we are so far from the righteousness that, that God would require of us without the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ applied to us. Lord, we thank you for these relationships in our life. And right now, we just want to pause and offer to you these relationships that we know are broken. We lift them up to you, Lord, and just offer a prayer. that our own life in this relationship we pray about would be a place that you can apply your healing and grace in these coming days and coming months. We praise the Lord Jesus. As we uh, turn to our hymn books for singing in response to God's word today, we're going to turn to number 431. Let there be peace on earth. Today, if the